and welcome to this. It is the Egg Chasers Rugby Podcast, the podcast about rugby that doesn't take itself or the game too seriously. I'm JB in the Rugby Dungeon with my trusty Labrador, Phil. How are you, Phil? Uh, if I'm a trusty Labrador, what does that make you? The owner of the Labrador. <laughs> like, what else would I be? I'm more thinking... The, uh, the dog, Labrador breeder. I'm more thinking the dog analogies. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'd, I'd be the... Um, I would be the Mikey... I was going to say Mike, Mikey Maycock. What's his name? Mikey Maycock. Oh, what was his name? London Irish hooker. Tim. Mikey Mayhew. Mikey Mayhew. Mayhew. I'd be the Mikey Mayhew of dogs. The, <laughs> the Great, Great Dane. Great Dane. Very good. And uh, down the line, our very own King King was it King King James Spaniel, King Charles Spaniel, <laughs> the lap dog himself. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not Cocker. a big fan of King Charles Spaniel. What, what, when you got cocker spaniels, come on. Oh yeah, cocker spaniel. <laughs> Do you know the history of the King Charles Spaniel? No. Do you know why it's called a lap dog? Go on. Do you know, Tim? No. It is because it kept the laps of ladies warm when they were in their carriage going from place to place. Ah, oh, nice job. Yeah, lap, uh, lap dog. The lap dog. What's wrong with me? Lap <laughs> dog. I can't say any words today. Mikey Mayhew got everything wrong. <laughs> You've increased on your normal quota of weekend dogging, JB. Yes, I have. Couple of minutes of this pod. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what? Uh, uh, yeah, it's it, it's a terrible omen for the start of this podcast. That <laughs> what, introduction. What? Well, would intro. you be fired hey, from Virgin for this? <laughs> think about it like this, guys. It it won't be long until we're rejoined by all the part timers. Oh yeah, great point. Yeah, they'll be uh, shuffling out of hibernation, ready to go, pretending like they love really love rugby. They probably love it more than me. <laughs> <laughs> but just a reminder that we are the only podcast that's there for you 52 weeks of the year. And while there's been this barren patch where nobody can be bothered covering the beautiful sport in the build-up to what should be a fantastic tournament, just over, what, two month, less than two months away now. Yep. Just remember we're there. And uh, there's extra content, some of it's spicy. Indeed. at uh, patreon.com slash egg chasers we're probably due a, a, a quick patreon pod yes we almost certainly are actually mm. well before we let bog down with any nonsense let's go straight into some rugby um but before we do you can find us on twitter because we are still there at rugby podcast we probably Kinda. won't be too bothered about getting back to you there but if you do really want to talk to us it's contact egg chasers at gmail.com and Tim will be peppering this podcast well, with various emails no, throughout the week. I, I did a JB and I broke my phone within a week of having it, so did I've had you? to get a replacement, so I need to set up the email again. Oh, Tim. Tim Although, Tim, Tim. what I have done, because I'm in the Egg Chasers TMO shipping container down in London uh, this, uh, at this moment for the recording of the podcast, I don't have with me to share with you a package that we have had sent from Australia. From Australia? I'm just going gonna, gonna to tease you with that. Uh, that the individual may be listening, thinking maybe this will be the episode where their package gets mentioned. Uh, no, it'll it'll have to be next week. But uh, yeah, we have a, a special delivery from Australia. Incredible, fascinating. Yeah. So next mm. next week we can, we can talk about Australian packages. I can't wait. Well, just you remember you just mentioned JB uh, getting back to people or not getting back to people on Twitter. Yes. Um, we got a message. I think a week ago or two weeks ago. Um, about a topic that we were discussing very briefly, which was the non-retiring or non-international retirements from South African players. And Zarina uh, Gaby got in touch with us, suggesting one. A uh, South so African rugby player. international Well, no, so a South African who retired from international, yeah. but continued playing rugby. Okay, why did this come up? I can't remember, but yeah, go on, please. Because I, I, I was making the point that... Um, it, in, if you're called up by your country, it should be treated like a a duty, yes. not an option. So yeah. I don't I don't like the retiring from international rugby. And, and so we made the point that we couldn't think of any South Africans that do it. Maybe they're so patriotic that they wouldn't dare dream of doing it. But Phil's maybe about to correct us. Oh. Well, uh, Zarina has corrected us. Uh, although she does only say um, one person that she could think of, which was Yanni Duplessis. When he was playing at Montpellier, he played well four or five years after retiring from international rugby, kept playing for Montpellier. And she does point out that he was obviously a qualified and partially practising doctor. Uh, doctor as well. So he had a few plates spinning. But yeah, if, if you can think of any other South well, Africans... Bismarck was still playing last year or the year before. 
He he was he actually played against Ulster this season just finished. Did he really? What yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he got. But I mean, if South Africa called him up for the World Cup, he'd be there in a shot. Oh, he would walk over broken glass, I suspect. Yeah, exactly. Would have thought so. Yeah. Which is the point. Although it's actually quite a pertinent thing that you mentioned that because it's worth pointing out that whilst it's great that the smaller nations have been given the boost of the players being able to return to their nation of origin with the World Rugby's changes there, it, the the issue of money does cloud it somewhat a little bit because uh, Patheli, Yato and I can't remember the name of the other, but two Fijians, very, very good Fijians have... Uh, oh, Ratuni Rawa might have been another one. But they, they've yes. pulled out of the Fijian squad for the World Cup so that they can dedicate themselves to their top 14 club team. Which I think is fair. I mean, you've got to understand the motivations are different for different individuals. Uh, oh, I get it. Yeah. I mean, I, it, yeah, it'd be nice to see them play. It'd be great, but yeah. it is what it is. Uh, Yoto is a hell of a loss to any team. It's interesting because he's not played. Like, obviously, he's just made his announcement. But when he, like a few years ago, and I feel like I've not seen him for a few years, mm. but a few years ago, he was one of the best back rows in the world. He's such yeah. a dominant physical specimen when he was on form. Yeah, yeah. So uh, climb on skating, said- I guess. Yeah, probably something to do with why you've not seen him for, for a while. In, in the, the mould of Sam Underhill. Yes. <laughs> yeah, which we, we will mention uh, at some point on this podcast as well. So I well, was going through Twitter. Yeah, well, like, so what, what did, oh, go on, JB. You well, gonna I was going to gonna say, I was wonder, it's, it's interesting to know where we were, because we haven't actually chatted about this, how we want to navigate topic-wise on this, on this pod. Well, we'll come back to topics in a minute, because uh, we're talking about Fiji kind of-ish. So um, I sent a CrossFit buddy of mine, um, loads of videos today of guess which player to demonstrate what, what's the most remarkable story you can think coming out of Fiji rugby for the last 20 years most We're remarkable Penny Falfau. absolutely correct yeah so I started with a little thread on, like a little thread on WhatsApp a little personalised thread as I sometimes like to do I started with him when he was 19 all athletic and then I had the next picture of him in his Toulouse days, when he put on a bit more weight. Uh, a bit more weight is an understatement. But, but then I on. also pointed out that most people would assume that when a man goes from this size to that size, he'd be terrible at rugby, and then proceeded to bombard them with videos <laughs> of when he was bigger, and actually, in some ways, better. <laughs> like, it doesn't often happen that you get so out of shape and you become better at rugby. <laughs> it's... I mean, when he was young, when he first burst onto the scene, some of his running there is just magnificent. But he was just a fast guy. And I think oh, that's... But it, there is more than just being fast. There's lots of fast guys, but there there's the step guys. and the swerve and the, the afterburners. The balance. Yeah. But there's, but there's something even more impressive about... Uh, so I don't <laughs> Doing think, that way in 120 kg. Exactly. <laughs> I don't think he would have captured the public's imagination if he st- if he was Sorelli Bo... Uh, Bo- Sorelli Bobo, right? <laughs> Who like just stayed in great shape until he was forty and just ran run around people. That's that's boring, right? It's the romance of him going missing in the uh, not the romance. That's the wrong word. The tragedy almost. There's romance and there's tragedy in this. So it's like the fact that he got over he got overweight, but he was still an absolute force of nature. Like it's such a unique sight to see him stepping at over a hundred kilograms, taking people both ways, and then using that power. But then there's a the story about the. Um, like the French president, not the French president, but the president of the French club that he played for, Ogen, I think it was, spending what three, two weeks in a jungle trying to find him, <laughs> to try to track him because down. he had dental problems, and no one thought to mention to the the French club he had den- dental problems. He you know, was, there's so yeah. many layers to the story. It's a hell of a story. There, there was a brilliant one um, by uh, Dan Leo in the organisation. Yes, he it was the uh, Pacific. I can't remember the name of it, but the Pacific Rugby welfare um, organisation following him fairly recently, two or three years ago. Do you know how many caps he has for Fiji? A dozen. Tim? Yeah, I wouldn't have guessed more than 20. He only got seven caps. Really? It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. So somebody asked the question, and I think you might have listened to this, Tim, but they asked the question, um, what films, what stories are out there, what films should have been made rather than Transformers 26. <laughs> and or this Fast has, and Furious yeah, 16. Uh, yeah, exactly. And this would be one of the films. Yeah. <sighs> Such a talented player. So many layers to it. 
Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to re- uh, later in the podcast, I will bring back that uh, topic which you've talked about before and which you just touched on there with Transformers 26, the death of culture. There's nothing original. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. I will, will revisit that with something rugby related. Can't uh, wait. Bit. Oh, go on. No, no, sorry. Oh, right. I thought you said can't wait. I thought, so no, you said, you yeah, said no. can't wait. Right, can't got wait. you. But I, I think, unfortunately, because Phil made us uh, do the podcast earlier last weekend. Cause sorry, he's... guys. So that he can help save lives. Yes. Well, uh, indirectly. As a proxy for, by, indirectly, yeah. Um, to help his wife work. Um, we missed, we would have been doing the podcast when the Johnny Sexton verdict broke, which is a really strange time for it to break. But again, the benefit of the part-time podcasters not, not bothering to put out episodes is no one's on a podcast really had a say about this since, particularly. Yeah. I have got so many views on on, on, on this. <laughs> so, do you guys want to tee off? Well, if we just run through the details... Yes, that's a great place to start. So, for his uh, barrage of comments against the refereeing team in the Champions Cup final, he was cited and then suspended, and it was a six-week suspension reduced to three weeks for... I think I'm right to say both a, a guilty plea and also good um, track record. Yes. So three weeks. So he misses, I think all three, I think they've got... Three th- games, not three weeks. Sorry, yeah. three yeah, games, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah, three games, three matches, three meaningful matches, not training matches or yeah. game of three thirds or anything like that. Uh, three matches, which means I think he misses all of Ireland's warm-up games but then yes. he's a- available for the World Cup proper. Yes. yes. So, and in terms of, oh, just just let rip JB say well, what you want to say. You know, it's not that. I mean, everyone thought the world was ending, didn't they, on Monday morning? I completely forgot about this story. So, there's lots of comments on there, like, "Oh, rugby hangs its head in shame." Uh, what was the insinuation that the justice had been fixed somehow in order to get Johnny Sexton? Back to the World yeah. Cup was that the insinuation? No, don't get me wrong. I love it. I don't like the term conspiracy theorist as a pejorative because so, some of these conspiracies are true. Yeah, and, like nine eleven. And, yeah, and, <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> I mean, is it? It was, it was a conspiracy. Many of them, perhaps. If, if so, I told um, you that a group of Arab men wanted to blow up the World Trade Centers <laughs> and were training in Saudi Arabia right now, you'd call me a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> There was a conspiracy. Correct. <laughs> so it shouldn't be used as a pejorative. But but so what I say this not as a pejorative. I just say it as a descript a description of what happened. There are lots of people who think this was a conspiracy to enable Johnny Sexton to be able to play at the World Cup. Well, I hope it was. It's, it's been fixed. Yeah, I hope it was. Like, I I think <laughs> that the problem with these people, right? Most of which have never played. Most of which have never had any meaningful sport in their life. Is they don't really understand that sport in of itself is like a community. And there's no, I mean, there's a small function of saying, well, look, Johnny has been good his whole life and he's got a good behaviour thing and whatnot. Mm-hmm. There's another thing as well. It's his, it's his career. Like, it's the crowning point of his career. And he's been a wonderful servant to rugby. You might hate him. I mean, I don't love the guy. I don't love Ireland. I don't love Lens. I don't like any of these things. But I understand that sport, you know, it, it exists because of people like Johnny Sexton. That's what that's what it does. Like, if you remove him from the World Cup because he said a few naughty things to officials, it's not great. And also, officials uh, well, well, need, well, but need hold to on. be respected. The World Cup should be immaterial, uh, like no, as far as I'm concerned. And the rules. So several, several, <laughs> several things can be true at once. So I'm pleased for Johnny Sexton; he can play in the World Cup for the reasons you just outlined. Yep. I think that the judicial uh, panel went by the letter and did an honest verdict in coming up with the six game ban uh, as the punishment for Johnny Sexton which was then reduced to three which is something we see all the time I don't believe I believe they did an honest uh, process and came to an honest conclusion so I'm pleased for Johnny Sexton the judicial people did an honest honorable thing and I also think it's not I think it's awful what Johnny Sexton did and I would I think the punishment doesn't fit the crime if what you care about is oh, it's a tough rugby, one this, rugby, it? rugby in the bigger sense. Because when you read Yako Piper's statement of what happened, it's absolutely outrageous what, what Johnny Sexton did. Me, and, you, and you, and, and and give me you have to come down on this with statement. a ton of bricks. What, give me an indication of what was on that statement. I don't, I, I've not read the statement, so I might actually change my mind if, 
if it's that jo- Johnny Sexton, who wasn't playing, yep. came onto the pitch after the final whistle, told the referee and his officiating colleagues they were a disgrace. I think expletives were used as well. And then every time the referees moved around, whether that's to go and get their medals, whether that's to go move to different parts of the pitch, Johnny Sexton, with his son, followed them round the pitch and just stood and stared at them. And it, to the point that the referees, who, let's remember, this is their cup final as well. Whatever you think of Jakob Piper, it's a big moment for a referee, just as much as it is any of the La Rochelle players winning. Jakob Piper and his team decided to leave the pitch because they were intimidated by Johnny Sexton. Well, I mean, didn't want to uh, cause I, any issue. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be intimidated by Johnny Sexton. That, that'd be the first thing. That'd be your first error. It's not as if it's Sean O'Brien back in his heyday. Although Sean O'Brien was involved with, like, like weirdly. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's not savoury, is it? And I'm sure that those things can be written down in the same way that you know, if you look at, at you know WhatsApp messages in a group. If you kind of take it out of context, or you're not there, or you know, two things can be seen, the same action can be seen differently by two sides. But I tend to yeah. agree from what you say. Yeah, yeah. The, the, inten- the intention may not have been like that from Johnny yeah. Sexton. I agree. Uh, it's not good. It's not good. But also, he doesn't deserve to have his career ended. I mean, like if he had a track record of this kind of stuff, I might think differently. I don't think he does. But, but, even but then, the, like, whether it, whether his career was ended. Is or not? Is yeah, down to him when he, separate, whether he decides it? to retire or, or not. You're just like that's like saying Dylan Hartley's been an England captain for so long. He shouldn't be. He shouldn't be. He shouldn't have his chance to be a British and Irish lion stolen. That's not fair. I would bend the rules well, for that as well. He was in. He was in control of that because he called Wayne Barnes an effing cheat. Yeah. Although he still said he still so, claims that he didn't. Yeah. But, so, <laughs> but like you know, so I just don't think necessarily that sports need the sort of judicial structure that you get for criminal proceedings in normal life. Because it is a community, it's almost like it's one of those things that you, it's almost should be treated like a family. Where yes, here is a very bad, here is a very severe punishment, but we'll let you off because you know we understand that the Lions is coming up, or we understand the World Cup is coming up, and we'll do our our best to bend the rules, but to be seen to be strict. And you know, if you're worried about the next guy, if you're worried about the the incentive for the next guy who does it, well, come down on him like a ton of bricks. It's easy. I'm, I'm Phil, le- what do you think? I'm less keen on the. Um... The bending of the rules, of course, for for obvious reasons, um, from coming from me, but also because it's like, this is bending the rules to get a, an outcome, or what you're suggesting could happen would be bending the rules to get an outcome that you quite like. Yes. Whereas um, there's lots of people who might say, well, oh, I don't know this this player um, Jack Jack Noel on Twitter was. Um, negative towards a referee who didn't take head um, injuries seriously enough. Therefore, Jack, should, Jack Noel should get an extended ban because he's not taking head injuries seriously enough. So yeah. people can... The problem with um, bending the rules like that is it all... Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. And as soon as you I start doing that, that so it, it's a slippery So my general principle slope. would be try and keep as many people playing as possible. So I'm not in, I'm not in the zone of banning people. I mean, I might, I might be up for fining people. Maybe you know, give up some cash, but we need you to play. You need him to play because he needs to play, and you need him to play for commercial reasons. And the fans want him to play. Like, there's three different constituencies there. That well, four of you include Ireland. Like, the game needs Johnny Saxton in the World Cup. That be and, my that be my overriding pragmatic decision. And that yeah, well, Johnny Se- Johnny Saxton's in control of whether that happens or not. Yeah, but so am I. So is every so, so is every other rugby <laughs> <other laughs> player. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm oh, on the overall. I'm okay with the way that this has been handled, and a lot of people, as you said before, JB, a lot of people not happy. Um, but I think I think six match would have been fine. I get it being reduced to three matches because of the the history and him pleading guilty is a it's a positive step. Yeah. When you read the transcript, as Tim gave you a little um, indication of before, it's not good. Like to follow up, he, he followed up. The referees, he said, it's a disgrace you can't, you guys can't get the big decisions right, followed by expletives, most likely the F word, then followed them round the stadium, watching them, this is a quote, what direct quote from it, watching them with a fixed stare as though brooding. He <laughs> probably was brooding. And then as, he, as they walked to, the, to the, their medal, the referees' medal, medal presentation, Mr Sexton mouthed something... Um, including the expletive effing. So he's kind Locking of follow, well done. <laughs> following them round, um, just in a way that is, it's not, 
it's not positive for anyone involved. No, it's not. Like, this, I completely this is, agree with that. This is the sort of thing where I, I drag him into an office and you give him a third degree. <laughs> give him a bit of a beating. Yeah, like... L- you know, rough him up a bit. So some real stern words need to be had. I do think sometimes rugby doesn't do itself any favours because, you know, by creating this image that we're going to have open and clear justice and there's frameworks and there's this... I, why? Why? I'm kind of surprised. I'm on it genuinely. Well, I, I don't know if you actually believe what you're saying because I'm, I'm, I'm quite surprised that you're going. It's Johnny Sexton. He's one of the best players, so we should just let him off. If it was someone I don't care about or, or isn't as good, then well, the thing is, I would the book at him. I would not really, I wouldn't not really care about any players. So if I wanted something awful to happen, like a battle, it would probably would be Johnny Sexton, Leinster <laughs> Island, right? So he's right at the bottom of my priority list for protecting rugby players but generally speaking i just want as many people to play as possible and i hate this idea of sort of we have to have this open sort of judiciary system which t- tends to punish players for not only things they have done actually wrong like johnny sexton has actually done something wrong here um but also things you know like you know the player sightings and everything else and you know, i just don't yeah, like it if, if, i guess the, the, yeah sorry go on, phil i'm just gonna say if if it's not johnny sexton it'll be someone else wearing the the island shirt so it doesn't matter. We're still going to see people at the yeah, and it's interesting. It's I think that's opportunity more, for someone else. And I think that's a more interesting conversation, actually, it's, which is not you know should Johnny Sexton be there or not, but what does the next guy up do to make sure that he doesn't have three games in the shirt but four games in in, in the shirt? Yes, and that's a far more interesting one for me. Yeah, it'd be and, far more interesting if Billy Burns won the World Cup. <laughs> Crikey. Yeah. Oh Christ! I know it wouldn't be Billy Burns. But Did you hear? That'd be damn interesting. What a story that would be. That would be um, a hell of a story. I, I, I would just, before we depart this, I will just say, I have been, I have refereed under 15s like, all last season and and, so, and it's getting worse. The descent. It's, it, the descent, the, the chops, it, it's getting significantly worse year on year. But I've heard this for like 20 years and if it was considered, if it's getting worse and worse every single year, it would be like refereeing in Baghdad now. Like, it, it doesn't ring true to me because I've literally, I, I've seen awful things when I was 18 and I've seen some bad things now. I don't think it's getting worse. I just think it's always been the same. But we like to say these things that it's getting worse. I really don't think it is. I, I, I do think, though, you can have really bad days and it can cluster like two or three weeks in a row and it might give you that feeling. But I'd be surprised if it's getting worse. Mm. No comment. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not I, sure. I don't. I I remember playing football as a kid, and some of the parents on the sideline were, yeah. and some of the players to the towards the referee was it's it was an absolute disgrace and you a will. joke. Whereas generally rugby, people have a moan about the decision. They will still generally, and this might have changed him. You might correct me on this, but they'll generally even if in a rough game, rough area in Manchester. They'll still call the referee sir. Oh, They'll still show no. some respect. Have you ever no? played De-, De La Salle? I've never had the pleasure wow. of playing De La Salle. Wow, these guys are special. Like, <laughs> it is a... I mean, so the, it, I put these guys... Nobody likes De La Salle. There's just a thing. Nobody likes them. And they revel in it. They absolutely revel in it. And they will fight you. I mean, like, there are tough clubs, like Oldham and, Win- and Winnie's and, you know, uh, probably um, Witness are in that category too. Yeah, like, yeah. Proper tough but quite honest with yeah, their yeah. toughness. You know, there's going to be a few digs. De La Salle are just a different breed altogether. <laughs> just a different breed altogether. But there again, De La Salle serves the Salford area. It's kind of up by the hospital there. Um, really, really well. And afterwards, they're very, they're very, very nice chaps. But, yeah, well, yeah. I, I would say it is all relative compared mm. to football, whether that's now or when you were a kid, Phil. Rugby's a dream. Oh, infinitely better, yeah. Have yeah. you ever had a coach yeah. sent off from the sideline? I don't think no. so. As Subs, an adult or a kid. Sub sent off? Again, don't. Th- I c- not that I can recall. I have had. <laughs> at talk age, I'd say our director of rugby has been sent off at least twice. <laughs> really? Yeah, at least twice. Jamie. Yeah, Jamie. Uh, definitely once, maybe twice. <laughs> Jamie's a good lad as well. <laughs> um, He's a top bloke. We have had. Broughton Park 2's. Uh, Alan Marsland uh, has been sent off from the sidelines uh, definitely Chester away um, like a good handful of uh, I reckon four or five times in his long and storied career God I'm trying to think because I played for a good few years with an under Tim Ferry and Rich Senior who are two of the most explosive both back rows uh, both 
played for many, many years, played well into the 30s and 40s in Free's case and coached for many, many years. And I can't recall either of them getting sent from the sideline. I don't think a first team That's... coach who brought on Parker has been sent to the sidelines. I'm sure we lost one from Colwyn Bay. I've seen Abigelli lose um, two of their bench. Nice. Um, who were subbed off and then were red carded after, after been subbing <laughs> off. I've been, I've, I've been re- uh, red carded for, uh, uh, from the bench. For getting involved. Yeah, my only red card was was, was from the bench. <laughs> Just like um, Harry Williams. <laughs> so here's one thing. I don't know if you remember this, but I remember when I was a, like, a, I think it was Colt. I was like a Colt or, or under 16 or under 15. Whatever age group it was, it was a junior level at Newbury. And I remember we had a whole club meeting because as a club, we were on <laughs> three or four red cards. <laughs> Wow. That's through. That's from like minis right through to the first team, and if you got five red cards, you would get demoted. No, uh, awful culture there, Tim. What, Terrible. What's culture. that all about? <laughs> that, that was an, no, no. That was that was like an RFU thing across the board. No this is and, and, and also uh, like it was that around the same time. If anybody swore at a referee, yeah, you would get banned for a year. And this was on posters put up in the clubhouses. It was like, you will get banned for a year and you, there may be consequences for your club overall Goodness if anything, anything happens. But, but I, I know you say that. I know you say that, but it's the deterrent was... This is kind of what I mean when you go back to sex. You go, oh, we let him play. It's, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying... I'm not being... Um, what's the word? Uh, where, where, like prudish or what, what's yeah. that mm. word? You know the word I'm Yeah, 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 yeah. I know exactly what you're trying to say. I'm not being prudish in that sense, um, but I do think there's an element where you start to give the impression that it's not as serious. Yeah. Then, I, you, then the consequences follow. But do you not think it's precious because you do it voluntarily? So I always call the ref, sir. I never swear at a ref. I always make sure that he's got a drink at, you know, at the end of the game. I never criticise his decisions afterwards, but that's my personal decision, and that's yeah, why not everyone does that. Yeah, and, but, but yeah, but not everyone should do that, and I think that's why that's why it's special. It just needs a majority of us to behave in that way for it to be acceptable. Like I have no interest in trying to persuade a guy who doesn't want to behave like that to behave like that, unless it's for you know, talk H. In which case, I would want him to do that because I see it as a com- competitive advantage. You know, we want to have a reputation of treating refs well. Yeah. But, um, so you want so, uh, so so I understand. It. I'm not actually. Um, I'm not saying. Well, I'm, I'm not asking the question. Going doing a Kathy Newman. So what you're saying is. <laughs> so was, is it? So what you're saying is you want a majority rule, kind of democratizing how rugby goes. If the majority of people just want to call the ref for that, ref for well, yeah, drop C bombs own, at the ref, and it, they're okay with that, then then rugby's okay with that. Well, it has its own consequences in my in my world, right? So. If I'm against a team which likes to swear at the ref, I'm pretty sure we're winning that game. So I, I think, you know, it sort of sorts itself out anyway. You need to get the ref on side. There is no advantage to swearing at a ref. There is no advantage. I mean, if Johnny Sexton sees Jaco Piper in the future in a game, I'm not sure all the decisions will go his way, and nor <laughs> should they. So, you know, the actions do have consequences. I'm just mm. saying we need to be a little bit, you know, careful. I, 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 I'm okay to put my faith in other people, but I, I'm actually equally, and I know you have your issues with leadership in rugby, yep. um, but I am quite happy to have stewards of the game who crack the whip when necessary yep. to maintain things which some people may be opposed to. Yeah. Mm, uh, yeah, I mean, it has to happen, doesn't it? It has to happen. It's just finding that line of where it does happen. Mm. Yeah. Now, there, there was another bit of news that I think came out it was either after we recorded on Sunday or early on Monday. Um, and it relates to a bit of news that came out a couple of hours ago. And that was oh, the England, England squad. England squad. Yeah. Yeah, what is going on? So last Sunday, there was an updated England squad announced. And there was only two changes to it. And two people dropped out of it. Bevan Rod, who was one of the four um, loose head props, yep, dropped totally out. That. And Sam Underhill also dropped out with no one coming in to replace them. And then a couple of hours ago, this is Sunday night, it's about half nine now, a couple of hours ago, there was another squad announcement that a further two players have dropped out in Val Rapava Ruskin. Oh. And Caden Murley. 
Oh. But Bevan Rod is now back in, and Billy Vanapola and Ollie Lawrence, who were in the rehabilitation group, yep. are in. Ollie Chesham and Jack Walker are retained in the rehabilitation group. And Michael Vanapola, who was actually the fifth loose head prop who was named in the um, rehabilitation group, is no longer named in the rehabilitation group. Right. So, yeah, we're back to Thanks. three loose heads in the squad. Genge and Marla, who look like they are going to be nailed on at this point. Yeah. With then potentially one of, th- one of the remaining three, uh, Bevan Rod, Valor Pavaruskin, and Michael Vanapola. Making up that third spot with Bev and Rod currently wearing the shirt, the training shirt. But, but now that means, but that, well, yeah, I suppose that's what that was what my question was going to be. Does that mean the props are decided? We've got our three tight heads and we've got our three loose heads. I'm not sure. Or if it does, does that mean does that mean that Bev and Rod could drop out again and one of the others could come back in? That I think it's still open to be the latter. So are we all in agreement that Marla, Marla should be nailed on? I think Marla and Genge both. So, in terms of their scrummaging, again, she's number one. Oh, they're, they're, they're both is. in. Mar- I mean, Marla as far is, as I'm but Marla's concerned, been in and out. Marla's been in and out of the England squad. I think Marla is just on his day. So just class. Yeah, yeah but I, he's, I he's been in the entire time now. It, this is uh, this is what I don't understand. So, firstly, how how as Val Rapava Ruskin? So, sorry. Let me let me say things in order. As far as I'm concerned. This is like whittling down your squad. So it's not a hop in, hop out situation. It's when you're gone, you're cut. Or at least that's what it, we thought with Be- the Bevan Rod situation. So what I'm analysing from this is, this is what I'm making up in my head. Macro Vinopola is out because he's not going to be recovered enough from his rehabilitation to be able to take part. So he's been cut. That's possible. Yep. And possibly, has Val Rapava Ruskin done something that displeased the coaches in some respects, whether that's his training or something else, which means that Bevan Rod has now come back in in place of him. Wow, I mean, and Bevan Rod was cut, but has now been uncut. That is also possible. So I, but there, I'm sure there's lots and lots of other potential explanations, but that is well, there's one only two. There's only two weeks till they name the proper World Cup squad. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. it, could be, I mean, it could be as simple as saying, look, this week there's going to be a lot of work. We need to look at these guys. You're not going to get many reps. Go home. Uh, no, they wouldn't. They wouldn't do that to a player that's going to be in a World Cup squad, though. This but is they my don't point. know which one it is, so then they just swap well, but, around. But why would they? Why would you say if Bevan Rod was genuinely in the mix to be at the World Cup in two month, less than two months' time? Why would you go go away for a week? Because if there's two equal guys, I, I, I don't know. I'm just stick, I'm doesn't just, make yeah. any sense. I, I mean, I would keep them both. I don't know. I don't know. Is the answer? Let's just make. Let's just talk about it from a rugby point of view. You're a huge fan of Valve Report. Valor Pavaruskin over this season, Tim. Make yeah. the argument why you'd want him. He's absolutely massive. He is absolutely massive, that's a fact. He he is an all rounder, really good scrummager, really good ball carrier, really good at the breakdown. Yeah. He's got so many turnovers. I don't see a downside. One thing I do think is his body language is dreadful. Like he always looks hacked off he looks uh like he's moaning all the time and i've chat i know people that know him well at I was about to say that you're not the first person to say this and it's just he's an odd character yeah he's a total one-off character and that's just how he is and it's not according to them the people that know him well it's just and they've talked to him about his body language like you give off the impression you're not interested in your that. It, it sort of like, when it's not when it's not the reality when you actually track the amount of work he does and everything it's it doesn't match up does it not remind you of the opposite to a thoroughbred american college quarterback and how they're told <laughs> like you must do this val you must not do that <laughs> yeah but the output but the output's fine you can't argue with the output i think that's the most important thing the only other explanation that a credible expert because you could explain there's lots of ways that are just nonsensical the other credible explanation or potentially credible explanation is <gasps> one thing we know about uh, Steve Borthwick's career is he worked with Eddie Jones for a long period of time and it's mm. it's historically been a bit of an Eddie Jones tactic to take send players that he likes away 
to make them hungrier. Yeah. To get them, and that tactic it could have already have been used with Bevan Rod. He could use it, be using it right now with Valrapava Ruskin to, yeah. and then bring them both back in for the final two weeks or final that, week. I, I, I mean, I know Eddie right. Jones did this. I just it doesn't Bevan Rod doesn't strike me as the kind of guy who needs to come back more hungry. If your third place prop does not need any more motivation. Maybe you're nailed on starter does. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it could be that. But yeah. thankfully we're not in the Eddie Jones period of madness, are we? This, cl- this close to a World Cup, I can't see it. Because if there, if there was any doubts about someone's hunger at this stage, with the competition for places, if there's any doubt about someone's hunger, you, you cut them and don't, and don't look yeah. back. Yeah. But I mean, that would be the Bevan Rod thing. Oh, not Bevan Rod. Uh, Valve of the Ruskin thing. If they don't understand the player, that could be why he goes. Yeah, potentially. And, uh, yeah, it's just that Bevan Rod goes last week and then comes back in. That's the odd part. But it's, it's good that Ollie Lawrence is back and fit. That's great. Yeah, great um, news. But Bevan Rod really... does behave like a college quarterback. <laughs> like he is that guy. He's got. He's been yeah. to. He's been to sub, but he's done professional rugby all all his life. He knows how to talk. He knows what to say. He knows. He knows all the things to do. The, the uh, other... Kate, Kate, uh, yeah, sorry, go on. I was going to say I was going to say we should just touch on Caden Murray because yeah. a lot of people will be raising their eyebrows at that. He's had a, a stellar season, really exciting player. Johnny May still in the squad. Caden Murray gone. Yeah, now that is a hundred percent because he looks like a bad nineteen eighties magician. <laughs> his his moustache, yeah. his moustache and goatee combo. I've got a little picture of him here. Yes, J- please, JB. There you go, Tim. Unfortunately, you can't see oh, it. My, he, he looks. Do you know what he looks like? He looks like a professional crossfitter. He, he looks like a bridge. Um, he's a good-looking man in his early to mid twenties, in tremendous shape. What on earth is he doing with that moustache well, and goatee combo? I think that's combo? exactly what he's doing with that moustache and goatee. Uh, when you're that handsome, when you're in that <laughs> amount of, you know, that good a shape, this is why Exeter Chiefs can wear mullets because they are by far the most desirable men in Exeter. It doesn't matter; they can do what they want. They can do exactly what they want. And, well, that's uh, is... same for uh, what's his name, the London Irish winger who's not at Leicester. Ollie Hassel Collins. Yeah, yeah. You know, paints his, paint his nails. Paints his nails. He doesn't care because he's six foot. He's a six foot two giant he's super foot, athlete. He's six foot four. Six, six four. foot four. Handsome giant super athlete. Who cares if he paints his nails? <laughs> He'll do what he wants. Caden Murley's just. So, Caden Murley is advertising to the rest of the world he's better than you. Well, that's why he's dropped anyway. Yes. <laughs> so, so Caden, enjoy being dropped, idiot. Uh, uh, genuinely, I think Murley and Sam Underhill. It's just an indication of the strength in those positions. Yeah, you've, you've, got, you've got to whittle it down at some point, and they are the first casualties of that. I think so. It's at, it's at this point, guys. I'm going to bring up my death of culture. There's nothing original anymore. Oh, there, there we go. go. England 2023 is a reboot of England 2007. 2007. Seven. That classic year. Wow. World World Cup in France. Yes. Yeah. Tick. A load of old players. Well, no, sorry, a, a selection of older, out of form players who have been brilliant in the past and maybe not as good at the moment. Yep. Yeah. Ben um, Youngs, Tuolangi. Youngs, Tuolangi, Tick, Tick, Vunapol. May. Uh, yeah. Billy Vunapol is back in. Billy V. Exactly. There we go. Dan Cole's and in there. Dan Cole, that's the one. Dan Cole and Dan they, Cole is the Martin Corey of, of this squad, <laughs> and they will have. They you could quite look at the draw. You could quite see them winning really, playing really awful rugby, getting to a semi final, beating France, and then being in a World Cup final. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. I can't see them beating France. Wait a second. Wait a second. Yeah, on any given day. But yeah, maybe until just, until just, you said that, I agree with everything. Just else. hold that thought a second, right? So we've got Owen Farrell starting at ten. Who is basically Johnny Wilkinson. Wilkinson. Right? Johnny Wilkinson. Now he gets injured, right? What we need now is someone who has never played ten in their life to step in at ten. So that'd be Slade. Slade steps in at ten. <laughs> right? We had Andy Gomesol at, at Scrum Half and Ben Young's Andy Gomesol. That's a good that's a nice fit, isn't it? That's a yeah, nice, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Fit. But Gomesol was really good. That was that'd be the difference. <laughs> Andy Gomesol was playing. Was he playing for Gloucester or Quinns at the time? I can't remember. I think he's playing. I think Quinns at the time. I think Gloucester. 
Uh, well, I've got the uh, 2007 World Cup squad in front of me. And it says Quinns. Quinns, uh, yeah. So I, I Quinto think Johnny May. For Quinns. Perfect. Quite, quite. Yeah, but it's the... Yeah. No, no, but you're forgetting the Ollie, the Ollie Barkley. Ollie Barkley, Johnny Wilkinson, Mike Katz and Andy Farrell carousel for the 10 shirt. <laughs> that, that was the real drama. <laughs> what a glorious yeah. World Cup. Do you know what? If it's a reboot of that World Cup, I'm, I'm delighted. I'd be in. Yeah, I'd be all in. Uh, apart from the final result. Uh, the, the other thing to mention, though, did you see Charlie Morgan... Uh, picked up on something from yes. the O2 Inside Line video. I I saw it, and then I saw an incredibly insightful video on YouTube, actually. Uh, oh. Egg Chaser's YouTube account. There's a very interesting video on that that I think everyone should go and check out. So just, Char- just what did Mr. Morgan find out? Because he always finds He's things. He spotted, in just in a, a very little snippet, an England uh, Inside Line, uh, Phil mentioned... <laughs> A couple of weeks ago, uh, that they accidentally let out a bit of content they really shouldn't have <laughs> let, let out. When, what was it? This was, was suggesting growth. Uh, <laughs> yeah, was besmirching the good name of Charlie Yule's. <laughs> His nose is growing. <laughs> <laughs> He's had a trip stint uh, in South Africa. Uh, anyway, and now they've released a clip, and maybe they maybe they don't mind, but maybe they've just let us slip you know, England's master plan for the World Cup because Ford. And Farrell were in a back line together. Wow. Yeah, it was a clip of Ford passing to Farrell and then Farrell spinning it wide. So I think it was Daly. I think it was Daly. Hmm. Well, oh. So th- th- there could be a very 2019 feel. When you look at the squad as it is, you could, and remember, you've got to remember Steve Borthwick was Eddie Jones' right hand man. And you could have Ben Youngs, George Ford, Owen Farrell, Henry Slade, or Manu Tuolangi, Johnny May, Elliot Daly could all be in the same and Anthony Watson could all be a backline mm. which was basically identical to 2019 now that's an interesting point Anthony Watson you've been listening to the rumours circulating around him yes he's he's the first player that's got a kind of central contract basically allegedly it's, it's not a, train, a training it? contract but that, that would permit him to go to Leicester or stay at stay at Leicester, stay at Leicester or well Saracens is, is what he wants allegedly oh really Mm, who wouldn't? So who's Saracens, but Leicester have let go of Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. And they've got a little bit more space, so they might be able to bring him back now. Mm. Um, and he's played very well there. That's the other thing. He seems to have he, settled in Leicester really nicely. He, and he's in really good nick. He looked hungry. Um, he, he didn't look like Anthony Watson looked when he played for Bath. He looked more like Anthony Watson looked when he played for England or the Lions. Yeah, which is... Good, the good high, version. Yeah, the, yeah. Talking of players that are rubbish for Bath, <laughs> but are amazing, John the Joseph has left the Premiership. He has two D2? I think it is pro D2. And now that is a real shame. Uh, I think it's just worth reflecting. I know we want to talk about the England squad, but I think he's one of England's greatest centres. I really do. I loved him when he was in his pomp. He got one Lions tour? Yep. Maybe two uh he 2017. was so, so phenomenally talented. Yeah. And is still so phenomenally talented. Uh, what goes on at Bath, we will never know. But, um, you know, I'd love to have seen him give it one more blast at a serious club. Yeah. Which utilise his talents. So Hopefully he's gone to the Champagne, re- the Champagne region in France, where he can well, pour all that good stuff all over the floor. Well, you know, fingers, fingers crossed. He Well, he's... Uh, South West Coast, so Biarritz. Biarritz. Is West, West Coast? Yeah. Oh, come on, JB. You can't begrudge a man Biarritz. I most certainly do, do not. Do a bit of skiing. I'll go down to the beach. Oh, man, what yeah. a life. South, South West Coast. Not too not too far from the Spanish border. That's a nice fit, actually. The yeah. whole Biarritz history. Hop along there. to Barcelona for a weekend. Yeah, or San Sebastian. Not too oh. far away. Well, Incredible! It's just or a shame. That, so, but this is sort of the shame of the Premiership. I don't like losing players like this from the Premiership. You know, he is just a quality, quality operator. And I think in a different time, he probably would have been snapped up by one of the Premiership com- uh, rivals, and uh, you know, would have loads right. of good rugby left in him. Mm. That said, from Bath's point of view, it's time. It's time, isn't it? To, I, uh, I agree with that. Ha- hand yeah. the keys well. to to Mad Max. Yeah. Yes. Well, how uh, Max t- Ajomo and Ollie Lawrence. I thought you were talking about the other Max and Max. What's the other one? He plays in centre. Max. Uh, Max Clark. 
Maybe. No. Maybe, maybe, maybe yeah. it's on the dragons. Is it Max Clark? Maybe Max Clark. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I was I was talking about your boy Ajomo. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he's fine, mate. He's fine. I think the future is going to be Ajomo, and it's going to be in the thirteen channel uh, Red Path. Red Path thirteen. Yeah, I think so. Interesting. I think he looks a lot like Henry Slade in that thirteen channel. Mm, bit of a rangey runner. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Uh, so just just to just to tie off the England squad, we now have forty two names in total that it appears are still involved. Obviously, there's the caveat, as we've seen with Bevan Rod, that the player can come back in. But if we're to believe that there isn't a case of... It's it's not like some Love Island where, oh, you've been voted out. Oh, no, no, you've been voted back in. It, it, as long as it's not like that, and it is just culling the squad gradually. We've got nine, nine out of the current squad will not go to France. 33 of them will. I mm. wonder how different the squad would look if... So how many guys were there originally? 40... Uh, if we add the ones who've been cut, uh, Merley, Rapava, Ruskin, there's, Runapola, 40, there's 46. Mercer, yeah, so, so 46. Then. Underhill. Well, Mer- yeah, it depends because you've if you around in- about 50 in total. Yeah, if you include the pre uh, oh, official squad, because there was a period of maybe two weeks where none of the finalists were in. So there was an extra like ten or twelve players. I guess like uh, Finn Smith were in there for a period of time. Alex yeah, so it's probably, it's probably sixty people have been involved in the yeah. process so far. So and we're down to forty-two. Yes. If if they had a full-time camera crew from day one of camp until the final cut, and every day there was a telephone vote or you know, whatever <laughs> it was to keep or get rid of players, um, I do wonder how different the squad would be to what co- the coaches said. And the coaches have like three wild cards to reverse decisions. So like if Owen Farrell goes day one because no one likes him, like they just say, no, 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 this is too far. This it's is ludicrous. This, it's ludicrous. He's coming back in. But I, so I, they, after three days, they've used all three wild cards on Owen Farrell. And on day four, <laughs> day four, he's gone. And then, ben, and then Ben Spencer comes back into the squad. Ben Spencer's in, Ben Young's is out. Exactly. Uh, I... I I, not only would it be great content, I wouldn't be surprised if the wisdom of crowds actually picks a better team than the coaches. Uh, you say that you, you have been on Twitter, haven't you? Oh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not so sure the wisdom of rugby crowds. Twitter's is, not real life. Uh, it is real life, Tim. It is real life. life. That's why we can't tackle high. It's not real that, life. That, that's why the extra chiefs have, have now got a stupid thing on their logo. That's why wasps don't exist. It, 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 it's real life. It's all real life. Oh, talking of which, um, I got sent a video of uh, some racist wrestling in um, in the sand. Oh yes, we had our man, yeah, our premier tie sale egg chasers club tie salesman so, Bones. Yep, was down on the south coast, um, not too far from Exeter, and he sent us some videos. Yeah, and the uh, Chiefs were wrestling in Exmouth. Yeah, wrestling in the on the sand. Oh man, I'm going to be there in a couple of weeks. They could have waited. <laughs> we, we can uh, ask about, see if you can get involved, Cocker. Yeah, they'd, I'm sure yeah. you'd like that. They'd love it, mate. They'd love it. I'll have them. Schickling and uh, Yendel wrestling. If you, you. If you just if, if you're in full full extra uh, gear and you just jumped in, I wonder if they'd if anyone would question if you just wrestled one of them. <laughs> like that you know guy what, who the, did it, the, the <laughs> full kit guy. Yeah, yeah, who yeah. Did the Champions exactly. League feet with yes. United. And just see if you can get a full session in with the extra Chiefs. Yeah, this this is what separate. This is what will separate us from uh, part time podcasters. Is we're talking about Exeter Chiefs now, and everyone will be focused on their squad now. And what my, what was in my head? It was, oh, I wonder what Don Armand's up to now. Um, I can tell you, he set up a clothing business which um, caters for gamers. Things like compression socks for people that don't move much, <laughs> like DVT <laughs> socks. Yeah, exactly what he's doing. Uh, nappies. I, it makes sense. It makes sense. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's what that's what he's done. He's got a business partner. Do you want to know something about Don Orman's dad? <laughs> or always. always. So Don Orman's dad and my dad have got something in common, other than they've got um, uh, profoundly efficient rugby sons. The only thing, the only well, um, one of the main things I know about your dad is he's a big, big friend of Neville Southall because uh, yes, it's pigeon true. Why? he's a pigeon, yeah, pigeon fancier. And what does uh, and what does Don Armand's dad do? Uh, he's into, if he's not pigeon fancying, he is, is he pigeon fancying. Oh, is he fan, pigeon, pigeon fancy as well? Okay. He is. He uh, works. Awesome. He's not a pigeon fancier himself, but he works at one of the biggest lofts in South Africa, 
uh, because apparently there's a competition that they need to win. So he is now working at that loft, hoping to win a, com- a I don't know, some race. I'm not, I've never even heard of the race. But it's South African, and there's a lot of money involved in pigeon racing. So awesome. that's what Don Arman's dad what, well, was doing. Well, he's still doing it now, I do not know. Cool. Always love to hear about rugby parents. Exactly. Hey, Tim, I bet you th- bet you didn't think when you said, what is Don Armand doing now? I would have the answer to that. <laughs> I'd have such a thorough... Well, not even Don Armand's dad. Don Ar- uh, not, not even Don Armand. Don Armand's dad. I, I, I imagine if I let the conversation go on much further, you'd be able to tell me what his second cousin once removed is up to. But we have <laughs> well, to move on, JB. So only mention that. Leave that. <laughs> what else is going on? Um, there was a Lions tour announced. Yes, that, yes, it was. Did, um, did you see the announcement, or have you have you, have you read the details? I, I see I've read the playing, details. I didn't see the announcement. They're playing oh. every Super Rugby team. They're playing the Wallabies three times, and they're playing a Australia New Zealand combined someone or other. Correct. Yeah, they, um, they go to uh, start in Perth, predictably start in the West and work East. Uh, they then play Queensland Reds, the Waratahs, the Brumbies, the game. A week before the first test is an invitational Australia and New Zealand 15, which replaces what would traditionally have been the Australia A. Yeah. Then the first test... But Australia A still exists. Australia A does still exist. They played last weekend. Yeah, but against not, Spain, not for this. Uh, they played against uh, Have they, have they referred Tonga to that or... as the Anzacs? Because that used to be that... I remember that traditionally there was a... There was an invitational Australia New Zealand combined team that they called the Anzacs, but I wonder if there's a reason why maybe that word's not allowed to be used anymore or something. No, like yeah. uh, Anzacs is the army, right? Don't know, but this is this is Don't on the announcement us. that I am looking at. It is invitational Australia and NZXV at the okay. Adelaide Oval. Yeah, because otherwise they would not Ooh. be going to Adelaide. They play the first test at Suncor Brisbane. They play then a midweek game in Melbourne on the Tuesday against the Rebels. They then play the Saturday, the second test, which could be a deciding test, um, or may not be, at the MCG, 100,000 people watching in the Melbourne Cricket Ground, and then the final test is Sydney. So that, that's quite exciting, and um, presumably Eddie Jones, unless his World Cup goes disastrously wrong, which it may well do. I think it will do. Um, he could well be the head coach, which would be quite Would spicy you fancy that well. one, lads? No. Yes. <laughs> Always. The only one I fancy really is South Africa. Mm. Other than that, I'm just not that interested. Do I have to be vaccinated to go to Australia? Probably. Probably not. Do you have to be vaccinated to go anywhere? I think. I think those those like the Southern Hemisphere dictatorships. I'm, <laughs> I'm almost certain. I'm almost certain that there's some sort of vaccine. Not un- not unwound it. I am suspicious. I, I I'm I'm I love. I want Canadian rugby to be better, but I've got issues with Canada. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and Australia and Canada haven't, and, and New Zealand haven't. Um, not covered themselves in glory, have they? Brilliant. No, they haven't covered themselves in glory the last couple of years. Yeah. Just into not the rugby, quite apart from the rugby. Although you mentioned Eddie Jones, will he get fired after the World Cup? Uh, there was a, there was an interesting article which was basically making the point. I, I, actually, I did, did you say it? Phil, I can't remember whether it's someone else I had a chat with, but basically. Pointing out that Eddie Jones, what what can he do with the pieces he's got? Well, I don't think they're that bad. The pieces that he's got. Well, we had the conversation last week. He's got some great pieces, and then he's probably a little bit light yes, in a few right. places, and probably not got as much depth. Like if if he if he is select he, like ten was the one that we pointed out last week. Oh, he said something in the press uh, this week which which upset me. <laughs> what did he he said uh, New Zealand better watch out. Was no, it, was something, it something worse than that. It was, so, Eddie Jones is remarkably good at convincing everybody. Bill, Bill Sweeney was the ultimate, uh, that he's a genius. So, you know, Eddie Jones had Bill Sweeney wrapped around his little finger after uh, everything that I could tell. And the reason is because he's very convincing about his knowledge of the game, which, I know, is probably brilliant. I mean, he's, he probably knows a lot about the game. Um, he said... Australia need to find their bottom before they can return to the top. (laughs) I do not like this one bit. Uh, Not one bit. That is a ready-made excuse for a few more losses. That is on par with the Test Match Animal quote, which I don't have enough Test Match Animals. Like, uh, Don't worry, guys. We're going to get a lot worse yet. So, (laughs) really... It's it's, it's not even that, though. It's saying we might get a lot worse 
or we yeah. might not. We just we've got to find the bottom, and when we start winning, that's when you know we've we found exactly. the bottom and we're on the way up again. Still not found the bottom, might, guys. Might be one more loss. Might be ten more losses. That, Who knows? Way, what's so special about the bottom? You need to get there. <laughs> like, what I'm do they think they're going to find? I will stick up for him on the test match animal thing because I, I used to ridicule that, but the, the longer time has gone on, the more I actually think he knows what he's talking about there. Well. Yes, I mean, he knows what he's talking about in the same way that I know what I'm talking about, which is if I have 15 of the best players in the world, I'll win a World Cup. I mean, that's what he yeah. means, isn't no, it? No, but the, 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 the players who are amazing club players, and there's just a certain something that means they, yeah. they cannot... Look, if I it. get the 15 best players at international rugby, I'll win the World Cup. That's what he's saying. And that's a completely... No, I, I think it's a different point. Go on. Because I, I think he got... I used to watch every single Eddie Jones press conference when he was um, England coach. And he was so fed up with the inane questions that you would get asked from the press. Just boring, stupid questions from the journalists about nonsense. And a load of them were, so-and-so is playing well. Don Armand is playing well. Why is he not in the squad? Joe Bloggs is playing well. Why is he not in the squad? Matt Simmons is he's captain in the Chiefs out in Australia, Why is, uh, out in New Zealand. Why is he not in the squad? All, all this kind of stuff. So he just created a shorthand way of just shutting the conversation down which is a test match animal uh, interesting. He's not, I don't like obviously if you've got the 15 best players in the world like you you are going to do well by definition a test match yeah. animal must be one of the best players in the world yeah but he was just he was just trying to he was just became increasingly exacerbated with dull questions do you know some of the questions so I've I've experienced this at sale I the phrasing of the question is horrendous. They don't really know what to ask. That's the word. They just want to bring up a moment in the game. Or they just want to and hear, they need to keep hear the sound of their own voice. Well, yeah, maybe the national guys. Maybe, yeah. But they they want to bring up a moment in the game. They don't really have a coherent way of doing it, but they know they must ask an open question, so it can't be a yes or no. So they go to Dimes and go, yeah, so that bit when um, uh, Jean-Luc Dupriere did this, that and the other, I mean, that was a quite incredible thing. Wasn't it, Steve? Your thoughts on that? Like, yeah. it's just a, a terrible question. What is it you wanted to ask? Yeah. Just just ask that question. And he was bombarded with all sorts of stuff like that. But I actually think it'd be more annoying to be continu- to continuously asked, why is this guy not being picked? Why is yeah, that not? Yeah, yeah. You can see and the English press and English rugby Twitter and all of it, it just gets focused on uh, Rocco Daguni scored five tries in the last six weeks. Why is he not wearing an English shirt? Yeah. I think some of them are fair, though. I mean, I remember when Brad Barrett was playing 13 for England and he just couldn't get dropped. And he should have been dropped. <laughs> or he should be moved to 12. Or he should have played a, a different yeah, strategy to suit he, Brad Barrett. He, he was moved to 13 to accommodate uh, Sam Burgess, wasn't he? God, who was it? There's definitely a period. Because it, it was those two against his England-Wales in the um, World Cup group stages, wasn't it, in 2015? Uh, Brad Barrett was legitimately... Once he got his... Game together, one of the greatest 12s that the Premiership has seen. Oh, yeah. Right, he's right up there. But for England, he was terrible because he played the 13. You can't have had that many caps at 13. I seem to think he was only moved out there because of because of Burgess. Maybe. Because he never Burgess played... Burgess had like two games, and he's definitely played more than two games. At 13. Well, he never played 13 outside Ford and Farrell for England, I don't think. Because no, he, he didn't make that, so it's it's in the Lancaster era. Yeah, yeah it is Lancaster. It was never ready. But Jones. Jonathan Joseph was the thirteen in that era for a, a big chunk of time. Well, wasn't he? so was Luther Burrell. So it was Burrell and Twelve Trees. Yeah, twelve. Yeah, God, Twelve tr- Trees. They're, they're the nice little partnership. They beat Wales at Twickenham. Mm. A little, little think through, a little kick through. I was there for that. Mm. Um, how many? So that that's a key question. How many players? Did, uh, how many games did um, Brad Barrett play at 13 for England? I'd say 15. 15? Uh, I've obviously got 30 caps, half of them at 13. No way. No way half of his caps at 13. I'm not sure how to find this out. I have no, to go through no old team sheets. You'd have to go through every team sheet. Or yeah. we could let a listener do it and just tell us next week. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I have no interest in doing it. Um, Thank you, Phil, for the video you just posted on a WhatsApp group. I'm just looking at it. That yeah. That's the players wrestling on the beach. That's quite homoerotic, oh. that, just that whole shot, isn't it? I like Fantastic. It. Love awesome. to see it. I mean, it's like that's if they do Top Gun 3, 
They've had volleyball on the beach. They've had American football. Now they need to recreate that Exeter video. Yeah. Uh, how long do you reckon Jack Yendall could pin you down for? <laughs> he's, he looks good, doesn't he? He's big, and that's strong shick- boy. Shickling he's got him. Oh, is that nailed. Shickling that, that, that he's on top of? Looks like it. Just the mullet. Once you've flipped Shickling on his back, he's not getting up fast. Exactly. It's, it's like <laughs> getting Ben Tamafuna to the ground is the hard bit. Yeah. But once he's there, he's all yours. <laughs> Specifically when he's on his back. <laughs> and one of the guys um oh, I actually forget it. Let's not go there. Um <laughs> any any other news? Hmm. Don't believe so. Brilliant. Uh we've got we've got rugby championship games coming up this weekend. Oh uh Samo- Samoa. Oh yes. That beat Japan. And Fiji beat Tonga. So Correct. the oh, wow. Samoa beat Japan by two points. Michael Leach was red carded after about 30 minutes. Um, it was a bit of a mixed team from Samoa, I think. Um, Which was an encouraging result, though. Yeah, it's a bit disappointing to see um, so Japan playing in a big stadium in Sapporo, indoors. Hang on, I thought they were playing em- in... It's empty. Was it? Yeah. Is that not the one that we went to, England's first game? That was in Kobe. I thought I, th- I thought it looked like the Kobe Stadium. I don't think it was. I think uh, okay. I think it was Sapporo. I could be wrong on that. But regardless, it was pretty empty. That is a shame. Which is disappointing. Um, and Fiji beat... Sorry, it was a changed Tonga team, so I don't think it was their strongest Tonga team. Um, it looked a strong Fiji team with uh, Tui Silva and Waiya uh, Nas- Why- uh, Levu in the centre of the, the Toulon. 13 yep. in the centres with Radrandra coming off the bench. Handy, handy Fiji team who uh, they, they went 17 or 19 nil up, but then um, Tonga came back into it and it was a one point, a one score game until 10 minutes to go when Fiji just eased ahead. But good win for Fiji, encouraging from Tonga for not their strongest team. Yep. And from a Fiji perspective, they scored two rolling mall tries and one uh, try basically off the back of a very strong scrum, which against a pretty meaty Tonga pack is nothing to be sniffed at. And it's it's historically in going into World Cups, it's been a big area of weakness for yes. Fiji. So that's that's encouraging. Encouraging for Fiji, less encouraging for Wales and Australia, one would guess. You know what, I, I've got a feeling that the this is going to be the Six Nations, Six Nations, the World Cup that one of the Pacific Island nations is going to do very well. And I've just got a feeling. They've, they've finally got some real quality. Fiji's the obvious one, isn't it, with uh, that pull that could, that pull that happens in every World Cup, Wales, Australia, Fiji. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, they've got history doing it. I just like the strength of... Uh, well, I like the strength of Samoa, Samoa and Tonga now. I think it's going to make such a difference having older heads come back who have been there and done it before at the highest level. Like Even people like you know, Fekatoa, for instance... He's got so much experience to bring to bring to that team. Test much experience to, too. So, like you know, it's um, they've got to be England or Argentina though. Just right. can't see it. I mean, it's unlikely, but it's more likely than it was. Yeah, so, uh, I don't know. I don't know, but uh, I'm that. That's the, probably the narrative of the World Cup I'm looking forward to most. That's Ireland going out in the quarters and uh, England not making it out of the group stages. Those are the <laughs> those are the things I dearly hope happen. And Wales losing that is Fiji. that is the one reason I, that is one purely comical reason why I would have loved the Johnny Sexton band to have been <laughs> yeah, I was thinking up, this. And, up until semi finals like, after the after the to the semi finals it would have been hilarious. Well, do you know what would be great if they got to the semi finals and then he was allowed to play and lost the semi finals, so he still never won a quarter final, and he didn't win the semi either. And then we got rugby championship coming up this weekend. Exactly. Blood um, is low. Is that in Australia? Yes. It is. It's at the MCG again. Got no idea. It looks to me as if Australia will take an absolute pounding from New Zealand. Any any advances on that? I think if I, if I were New Zealand, I would just go and try and just, I'd go all out, play your best team and then chill. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's going to be a pounding. Uh, New Zealand are going to win big. I hope so. No, no, no more advances on that. Uh, South Africa or in Argentina? Uh, where is it? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Uh, no, 
Argentina are in Johannesburg. Ah. Um, I suspect uh, they will suffer a similar fate to Australia. Uh, yes. I yes. suspect so as well. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Agreed. Um, I'm very close to getting you an answer on uh, Brad Barrett. I was wondering why you were so busy. Sorry, I've been going a little bit quiet. Uh, and so, JB, you said 30 caps for Brad Barrett? Yeah, about that. Timmy, any more advances? Maybe f- somewhere... Uh, I'd have 46. Th- yeah, 30 to 50. Yeah. I, I would have put him about 40. He's actually 26. Oh, there we go. Really? Now, you said 15 outside centre. About that. And I thought that was wildly inaccurate. Uh, I The only one I could remember was um, Sam Burgess um, when they played for Wales. Was Sam Burgess at 12. Um, and I've got all the World Cup games, all the World Cup warm-up games in 2015... And then uh, Russ Petty on Twitter has very handily listed all of the England centre partnerships from 2012, when Brad Barrett won his first cap, to 2015, when he won his last cap. Who does these things? Well, Russ Petty. Russ Petty. Uh, And I can tell you there was a grand total of five games where Brad Barrett started at 13, Uh. uh, with that one in the World Cup being the only one of those. There was... Two uh, in the Six Nations, I think, in 2013, with 12 trees. Yep. And two Six Nations in 2014, I think think that was. I think 2014. Actually, it might have been 2012. Um, With not many, though. Mike Cat, no, Mike Cat retired after 2007. Oh, yeah, sorry. He was about 38 in 2007. So by 2014. Um, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. No, we don't need to go any more into that. No, we do. Who was the twelve? Who was the other person? So he's played. He's only played with. So not Toby Flood. He's played. But he's played outside three different players. And twelve. Jamie Noon. Twelve. Not Noon. Not Alan. Tom May. Not Tom May. Tom May. Really grasping the straws now. Um, Someone who's still playing. Are you Lutter Inley? Not are you Lutter Someone who's still in the England squad currently. Farrell. Faz. Wow. So he played Farrell two, made his debut wearing 12. Two with games. Brad Barrett, actually, against Scotland. That was the... Bat, that was the... Yeah. Yeah, Scotland. About that. So Scotland, so that's 2012. Yeah. So two of England's best fly-offs made their debut in the census. So yep. Wilkinson, Wilkinson. 13. He... Um, Hodgson at 12. And also... Oh, what's Hodgson? Did Hodgson play at 12? Yeah. Farrell at 12, too. Maybe Smith should have debuted at th- uh, 13. Can you imagine how ludicrous it would be now if we saw Marcus Smith, Smith at 13, 13 or 12? There's that period, uh, I say period, it might have only been one game, where um, Jason Robinson wore 12 for England. Yeah, against I remember it, that. Against, he definitely played it once against Italy, yeah. I can't remember. Didn't he play... Am I getting this? Am I totally making this up? Was there a 12-13 combination of Jason Robinson and a uh, very tall Jersey chap who played for Bath and Gloucester? Banners. Banners. Maybe. Am I totally making that up? I'm sure that was a centre partnership that in about well. 2006 or seven. Jason Robinson played... Yeah, he did play with 12 on his back. Yeah. Did he play at 12? Or did he just have 12? He played at 12. Yeah, he played at 12. Wow. They, I might mean, rewatch that game, see how that went. Because for a long period of time, like the the World Cup team in 2003, and then for a period after, they always had um, Tyndall and uh, Greenwood. Greenwood, yeah. But they'd play outside to win, so they'd play with Tyndall. I can't remember if he was wearing 30, but he would play like as a crash ball 13, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then to create room for um, Greenwood to do things outside. Can you add Toby Flood to the list of England fly halves that had their debut in in the centre? Hmm. Not Ollie Barkley? Maybe. Um, Ollie Barkley debuted at nine. Ollie Barkley debuted at nine? Debuted at nine against... Um, at nine? Yes, against USA. He debuted at nine when he's either 18 or 19. Wow. And I'll give you the year. It was 2001. 2001? Um, yeah, it was a Churchill Cup game. Wow. Any Great more questions, knowledge. Philip? Uh, he got his Bath debut in 2001. 
Uh, where was his England? England also 2001. Let's see what game? May, here we go. Uh, it was North America 2001. Uh, 16th of June in San Francisco. Um, he was 19 years old at the time. It doesn't say whether he came on at nine. He did come at nine. So that's fine. <laughs> um, I believe you, JB. Um, uh, what, just you, you reminded me, the person who picked um, Burgess and Barrett, Stuart Lancaster, changed his LinkedIn profile this week. He's officially started his job at Racing 92. Wow. Mm. This is going to be one of the and, great storylines. I can't wait. And, so Stuart Lancaster is a lovely, lovely man. He is... I completely agree. Demonstration. Here's a demonstration that he is so lovely and nice, almost nice to a fault. And the demonstration of that was that he posted on LinkedIn, I'm really sorry also, so he, he announced that he was uh, he's started his new job. And then he said, I'm really sorry, I've used up my allocation of free um, ads on LinkedIn. So apologies to the people that are trying <laughs> to... Uh, to, to add me i can't do any more so basically a- everyone who said can i be a contact with you he's just gone yes 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 what a lovely <laughs> and now he can now he can't do any any that he would like to do i would he is a nice guy i'd happily have him look after my labrador i'd not let him look after my professional rugby team though so you're looking him look after me yes exactly right you and rudy <laughs> uh, could be looked after by Stuart lancaster uh this professional rugby team steve diamond <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I can't find um can't find a match report that that gives me who Barkley came on for in two thousand and one. Just trust doesn't matter. Me. Doesn't we are the only people that care. <laughs> <laughs> Any I'm, sure some, that next week. I'm sure someone message us um at River Podcast on Twitter or contact edchasers at gmail dot com. Yeah. Let me know. I wonder if there's any others that have stayed debuted in the centre. Maybe maybe Garrity, but I don't think he did. I seem to remember Garrity and Flood sort of... Ryan Lamb? Yeah. Ryan Lamb never played for England. One of the... A, a maid... What? Really? Never played for England. Not that I know of. Mm. Um, I, I don't know. I, w- I would have said he, he he probably had a cap in that period where Barkley uh, and Garrity... He definitely played England Day. I'm sure mm. he's never played for England. England Saxons, five caps. Yeah, never played for England. He did make an absolute fortune at Worcester, though. He's on 400k at Worcester. <laughs> wow. That, I mean, that's ridiculous. So he did Gloucester, the Gloucester Tigers, Northampton. Who have I missed? Gloucester, Irish, Irish Northampton, that's it. Tigers, Worcester, La Rochelle. La Rochelle, and then finished his career? Uh, Plymouth? Scarlets. Did he? According, according to his Wikipedia account, which may or may not be right. Currently, currently coaching at Albion. We should mm. do that. We used to do that where we would just name chronologically the teams someone had played for. We did we used to do that as a little quiz at the start of the pod. Years and years ago, we'd say just the teams that they played for and then you have to guess the player. Yeah. And as my knowledge gets less relevant as I drift out of the game, this is basically the only thing I can do. <laughs> <laughs> this is it, boys. <laughs> Enjoy just it while it lasts. There, Excellent. Right, so um, if you want to, follow us on Twitter at Ruby Podcast. Or more likely, contact us on Gmail. Contact eggchasers at gmail.com. We will be there for you like we are every single week, every year, the last decade almost. So from me, Tim and Phil, goodbye. Let the boys play and we will see you next week. Beautiful. Good work. <laughs>